Okay, so good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Dr. Ariel Williams and I am the training and education specialist in the Center for Diversity and Inclusion at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, today we are hosting our first installment of the Break the Glass series uh, featuring women in STEM and we are collaborating with WashU's Women in STEM student organization and I'm very excited to have you all here. We have an amazing panel um, prepared for you all today and we are going to get right into it. Um, so in order um, of the list that I just uh, listed out, we'll do introductions. Um, and so just introduce yourself, um, where you are right now, and then how folks can um, get connected with you. And then we'll go get into the questions after introductions. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm on Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so good afternoon. My name is Dr. Ashley Towns, and I am currently in Atlanta, Georgia. I am a uh, researcher, a postdoc uh, researcher at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, I work in the epidemiology branch within the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention. And um, I've done a host of things in my career in public health, um, but I am a trained epidemiologist. And so i um, very happy to be here and looking forward to meeting with you all. Um, ways to stay connected, which I believe was a question, um, so I am on Instagram at Dr. Ashley Towns. Um, I have LinkedIn, Ashley Towns. And I don't use Facebook, but I have that. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Fang Chung Ling. I'm assistant professor at the Department of Energy, Environmental and Chemical Engineering at the Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, uh, so my research focuses on uh, microbes, understanding microbes and microbial communities uh, 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 that are found at the boundary of built and uh, natural environments, uh, ways to stay connected. So uh, I have a web page through the Washington University uh, School of, uh, School, McCarvey School of Engineering. And there has my email and uh, uh, information about my research group. Okay, it's my turn. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. I'm also on Eastern time, so it's just well after the afternoon. My name is Dr. Jessica Simpson. I serve as the Associate Director for the Ronald E. McNair Scholars Program at Fort Valley State University, which is located in Fort Valley, Georgia, um, a small town not too far from Macon and about an hour and a half, two hours out from Atlanta, Georgia. And what I have the privilege and pleasure of doing um, is cultivating students and helping them prepare for that next step after they obtain their bachelor's degree and um, hopefully getting them into or interested in at least into get, going to graduate school to earn their um, doctorate degree and if not a doctorate maybe their master's degree and just really getting them exposed to um, other opportunities that are available to them after completing their degree in their undergraduate institution. Um, Primarily, we focus on trying to recruit STEM majors, but I aim to recruit for, uh, outside of those majors as well, just because everyone I feel should be um, knowledgeable about opportunities to them after they get the bachelor's degree. Um, in addition to serving as the associate director for that program, I also adjunct um, teach for the chemistry department and at the same institution. So I, I kind of have dual roles. Um, the primary way to reach me would be via email at jessica.simpson at fbsu.edu. And I'll be sure to get that communication to um, Dr. Williams also so that she can forward it all to you as well. Oh, she just pinned it. Great. Sorry, I was so engaged with uh, Dr. Simpson's information, forgot it's my turn. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Dr. Jia Luo, and uh, I'm a senior lecturer uh, for general chemistry at the chemistry department at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, so my primary job is uh, focused on the teaching 
parts of the intra-level courses, uh, but I'm also the director of the general chemistry transition program, which provides some additional support for students uh, who may underprepared in terms of their high school uh, background. Uh, in addition to general chemistry, I'm also teaching, co-teaching uh, a course, Women and Science, with a professor from uh, gen Women, Gender, and Sexuality Study Department at WashU. Uh, so uh, the primary way to reach uh, me is my email. You can find my email from the chemistry department's website. Uh, so uh, I think that would be it for my introduction. Yeah, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Megan Doshbach. That is how you say that seemingly endless run of consonants that is my last name. Um, I'm also a senior lecturer with the chemistry department at WashU. Um, I got my PhD from the chemistry department at WashU in um, bioorganic chemistry. So I um, started off uh, in kind of a wet lab uh, research setting. Um, I made small peptide based molecules and we looked at how they behaved in uh, membrane systems, um, which was really fun, but I knew ultimately I wanted to focus my career efforts more in teaching um, than, than research. I really enjoyed my time as a researcher, as a graduate student, but um, teaching is definitely where my, my passions and I think most of my talents lie. So um, I have been uh, with the general chemistry program uh, for 10 years now at WashU as a lecturer. Um, I also direct one of our support programs, the PLTL program with our general chemistry course. Um, and uh, really um, have enjoyed um, not only my time teaching general chemistry, but also implementing new strategies um, and, and um, different ways where we can think about um, elevating and empowering students um, who have been historically marginalized in the sciences and particularly in chemistry. Oh, um, I'm super old school. I'm only on Facebook and I never signed into it. So um, unfortunately, really the only way to get a hold of me reliably is email. And I'm happy to put that in the chat uh, here in just a second. It's my last name, Dashbach at wustl, W-S-T-L dot edu. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Deshaun Samad. Um, I, I'm currently actually in Mexico, but I am located in Los Angeles. And um, my uh, career is I am a business operations analyst at Leap Energy, which is an energy startup uh, out of headquartered in San Francisco, as well as uh, the Netherlands in Utrecht, the Netherlands. And I um, currently, it works as a grid um, a grid kind of um, multi-use sharing format where you're able to um, use renewables rather than your um, rather than your regular power plant as a virtual power plant database. Um, and I work on bringing on partners, account management, and as well as fundraising. My background is in mathematics and environmental engineering. Um, in Previous jobs, I've worked at um, a municipal water district in the water agency, and then I've also worked um, for NASA as um, in their water and power um, human life sources uh, departments. So that's it. The best way to contact me is my email. I will go ahead and uh, put it in the chat. Thank you. Hey, uh, good morning uh, to everyone who's on the West Coast like me, uh, but good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Uh, my name's Tyler. I actually graduated from WashU a few years ago, and I currently work at LinkedIn. So I am in a rotational program, and I've been in a few different roles, but currently I am the product manager on the careers team, and what we focus on is uh, essentially kind of like the bread and butter of LinkedIn, which is helping people get jobs. So uh, I specifically focus on products that make the apply process easier. Um, and some like sort of big strategic things that the company and we're thinking about is how do we promote more skills-based hiring rather than hiring people um, based on sort of like what school they went to and stuff like that uh, to create more diverse hiring practices um, as well as leveraging sort of LinkedIn's data and community-based platform 
uh, to really just make more connections to help people get hired. Um, and the best way to contact me is LinkedIn, uh, <laughs> as well as my work email, which I'll, I'll put in the chat as well. Awesome, thank you all so much. Okay, so let's get into the very first question um, because I think um, a lot of people like to think that there's a streamlined way into a career and that is not always the case. Um, and so the first question is what was your path into your career? Um, and, and we can go in the same order that we just went. Okay, so um, <laughs> I have a very roundabout way of how I <laughs> entered into the work that I'm doing. Um, so I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I actually attended the University of Cincinnati, um, but I entered the program actually as a nursing student. I, um, I was in you know, the program, I was doing actually clinicals in the teaching hospital um, on a trauma floor, which basically is the, the floor that you enter after an emergency. So um, if you're not going to an ICU, you're, you're usually triaged to the trauma floor and then you're triaged out based off of the severity of your condition. So I've seen a variety of things, okay? Um, and I knew that that level of prevention was not where I wanted to be um, as far as prevention. So I wanted to be more primary prevention as far as public health is concerned. And I left the nursing program to enter a health education and promotion program. So from there, I received my bachelor's degree in that, my master's in public health, and I was working at a county health department doing disease investigations for syphilis and HIV, um, doing a lot of community education around sexual health, um, teen pregnancy prevention, all of the risk-based sort of sexual health things that we all hear about. Um, and I realized that there was a lack of um, addressing uh, what we call social determinants of health. So those are going to be education, uh, poverty status, or social economic status housing status, um, racism, discrimination, stigma, things like that. Um, and I really wanted to answer some questions around why aren't we addressing those things? Why do we still see high rates in certain populations or certain groups? Um, and that sort of led me down this research path. I entered a PhD program in health behavior um, and I minored in epidemiology, um, but I knew that um, science and math were always my strongest um, skills, even from a very early age, um, always did well in those two um, sort of fields or, or um, classes as I was matriculating through, um, through college. And so I really started to focus heavily on um, the statistics courses, um, so biostatistics and also epidemiology, um, and, I, and I paired them together. So I started to really use my epidemiology skills to answer the research questions around sexual health um, that I felt like really wasn't being addressed because everything in public health for the most part is um, risk-based, prevention-based, treatment-based, and not a lot of um, structural, um, answering structural questions and answering questions that could lead to political decisions, providing evidence to support um, dispelling stereotypes and myths about different groups. And so I, I, I learned that social epidemiology was a thing, um, which, which basically means that I am using um, the skills of an epidemiologist, which is to, um, for those who are not familiar with epidemiology, we basically study trends in, um, uh, for disease outbreaks. So prime example, we're in a current pandemic and epidemiologists are the um, sort of go-to people when it comes to going back in time to track how people were infected, what were the, um, what is the vector or the virus or the, the, um, the, the, the bacteria that is causing the issue, who is the host, so where does it live, how does it grow, what's the speed of time that it takes for someone to develop symptoms. So this field really um, develops and understands how that happens. And then they provide evidence that will then lead to treatment um, medication, vaccines, things like that. Um, so, but I wanted to look at things from a broader perspective. And so we take that data um, as a social epidemiologist, and then we apply it to the social structures that exist within our society um, and look at disparities within race, within gender, within age, 
Um, and then we really talk about how do we close the gap within those disparities. So started in nursing, now I'm a researcher <laughs> and um, I've done a, like a variety of things within health um, along the way. Um, but this is, this is how I ended up as a scientist that I never really thought would happen. And I love every minute of it. So I'll turn it over to uh, Professor Ling. Oh, wonderful story. I was so absorbed in the story. <laughs> uh, and uh, thanks, Dr. Towns. And so uh, I'm, a, I'm, uh, I'm a scientist slash uh, professor and uh, educ uh, scientist uh, slash educator. And so my, uh, my path into uh, science and engineering uh, started from my high school. So at, at, uh, before, like, before high school, I always thought I would become a journalist. Uh, or like that was my childhood dream. I want to I want to do exciting things. I want to go to the, the forefront. I want to report about the wars and uh, like the the important things in the world. And and then um, uh, in high school, I, I started on a, a science project that kind of changed my 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 path of life uh, uh, career and. Um, uh, so we, we, we wanted to, uh, so the project is about um, uh, what are the uh, diversity of invertebrates, microinvertebrates in uh, the city that I grew up in Beijing, what are the uh, uh, invertebrates in, in the sediments of the, the water. Uh, uh, local wa water bodies, and that that sounds like uh, very much disconnected from like uh, go going to like dangerous places. And uh, but how how did that came around? Like so we. Uh, it was like a first intuition was I saw like um, with the city's development, I, I saw a lot of you like uh, small ponds or lakes uh, in the park that used to be uh, pristine, look pristine. I know it's not pristine, that, but look pristine. Uh, start to get algal blooms, and then so like my high school teacher connected me to our um, to a professor of hers, a biology professor who study algae, and then like I got this uh, 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 inspiration to to study uh, really the, the the ecosystem in in our urban environment. We we do a lot of things to these uh, uh, urban ecosystems without uh, thinking much, so like. We uh, may see restaurants uh, like um, discharge some waste in, into into the local ponds. Like at that time, twenty years ago, uh, when I, <laughs> and uh, and without noticing it. So um, so that got me into like environmental research and uh, lead my lead to my choice in my career. And my current research focus on uh, microbes. Uh, I said focus on microbes at uh, the boundary of natural and uh, and urban environments. And uh, one of the system that we study is uh, the drinking water distribution system. Um, so um, uh, the the water distribution system is something that we seldom associate with microbes. Uh, we think about microbes uh, in, maybe in our yogurt, but not uh, in our drinking water. So the 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 fact is that. Uh, even in a heavily disinfected uh, uh, environment like the, 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 the drinking water, uh, microbes still can, can so life still uh, can, can survive the, the disinfectants. And uh, there, there are diverse microbes uh, that live in the pipe system that deliver our water. And so every time I say this, people are like, well, really, well, should, I be, should I be worried about my water? But really, the uh, our our body uh, are covered with microbes, and um, they are just everywhere, and uh, they help us to uh, do our digestion, uptake nutrients, and uh, uh, play important roles in uh, our immune immune systems. And so, um, uh, but but we know so little about these microbes. So starting from like uh, uh, invertebrates in sediment, uh, moving on to uh, microbes around us in water and uh, around the uh, spaces. So that. That's um, kind of like that uh, life around us, life at the intersection of um, uh, of nature, uh, nature and uh, and uh, uh, urban environments. I think that's something that really motivates me uh, in my career. Yeah, thank you. Wow, there's been a lot of um, great accomplishments. Kind of like a hard act to follow. I should have probably went first. Uh, let's see, how did I get into my current career? My story is 
I'd say it's one that's really interesting because um, I knew at a young age that I always wanted to help people. So I would say to begin, it started with the notion that I always wanted to help people. In terms of how um, it became more STEM or scientifically oriented came from the fact that I was the kid who was always in the kitchen making slime with my mother's um, cooking materials. So I, it, it, I thought at first it was a bad thing to do because I would always get fussed at for making slime out of cornstarch and water and food coloring, you know. Um, but then that turned into getting involved in the, uh, science Olympi Olympia at school and winning competitions, you know, just just learning and loving how um, robots and just learning all about science and how everything we did was, you know, surrounded by it. And so um, that was where I can say it initially started. Um, educationally or academically, I was always great at science, no matter the subject, biology, um, chemistry, even physical science to that nature. Um, and so that always was another notion that led me to say, oh, okay, you know, I think science is it. I was, I was pretty decent in math, but it wasn't my favorite subject at all. Um, I did enough to get by, but when it came to science, it was like something about it kind of just naturally clicked. Um, so for me, um, growing up, you know, the, I guess the first, the first introduction to what a doctor is, is the people who give us shots that we end up not liking very well. So when it came to that, um, that was, I guess, kind of how I developed whether or not I wanted to be a doctor and what type of doctor I wanted to be, just based on going to my everyday community dentists and physicians and that nature. Um, as far as my knowledge about what type of doctors existed, um, in addition to the ones that I saw, that didn't come into play until um, my college years. And while in college, I, I never was supposed to end up being exactly um, Dr. Simpson with a PhD in chemistry. No, that wasn't the way that it, things were supposed to go. I was initially supposed to become a pharmacist. And um, I'll just have to be transparent. After taking organic chemistry, you know, that kind of was short lived. I said, you know what, there, I'm good at many things. And Organic chemistry is just not one of them. So, you know, given that pharmacy deals so much with organic chemistry, that might not be the best thing for me to do. Um, I'm not as strong at it in it as I should be. Um, so then I started to consider other um, other careers that would still allow me to be a doctor because that it was always that I was going to be a doctor. I just didn't know what type of doctor I was going to be. And um, you may laugh and, and look at it as like a simplistic story, but you'd be surprised at how many students go through the, the same exact motions on a daily basis. Um, so I, I, I was trying to figure out what type of doctor was I going to be now because pharmacy, no, that, that was gone. Um, I thought about medical school, but at the same time, I considered my standardized test taking abilities and I wasn't as strong in that area as I needed to be to get the scores that I think I would need it to get for for medical school and plus um just being transparent again i was trying to go the least financially challenged route um in med school that that wasn't it either um so after doing some summer research programs um which allowed me to get exposed to different areas of science i did uh, one program in the summer that allowed me to do mechanical engineering um chemistry as a chemistry major you know i had never thought I could be relevant to mechanical engineering, um, but I learned that I could. Um, I actually worked on um, integrating uh, single wall carbon nanotubes into epoxies to increase their um, stability performance in cell phones, and so that was really cool, um, and then the summer after that, I worked on um, inter uh, in an inorganic chemistry lab, which allowed me to develop a sensor for arsenic in water. Um, so Dr. Ling, I, I kind of I kind of understand and can relate a little bit to what you were talking about because I too have dealt with the uh, research in water and it's just like stuff you never really think about until you have to into that into that depth. And so at that point, after doing research programs, I realized, hey, you know, I really like being inside of a lab and you know testing stuff out, making concoctions. Like this is really cool. So at that point, I determined in my life, I wanted to be a doctor or a scientist that worked in a lab. So, okay, 
Um, I ended up going to graduate school into my doctoral program at Louisiana State University. Um, go Tigers! And um, <laughs> reluctantly, this this my I guess you could say my trajectory changed once again because before, where I discovered that I liked really working in lab and doing experiments, grad school I think um, showed me that doing one too many experiments and just so much time in a lab can really make you discover a lot of other skill sets that you have that can take you places, you know, that um, are not in a lab. I'm a very sociable person. I like to talk with people. I like to meet people and be out and about and being in a lab all day with no windows doesn't quite, you know, fit that. So um, I started to get involved in different organizations um, that were on campus and outside of campus that allowed me to develop and hone in on the other developmental skills that I had and just never knew, um, or I never pulled forward enough um, as a scientist. And so that is kind of what led me to go into the academia side with my science. Um, yes, I earned a PhD in chemistry, so by nature, I am a chemist. However, I had experience doing um, national conference planning, programming, and putting together workshops um, for different organizations. So that is the kind of skill sets that was needed in order to, you know, fulfill the role of associate director for uh, McNair Scholars Program at the institution that I am currently working at now. And so um, I guess you can say I've had a very diverse um, experiences with science altogether going from being just the student trying to figure it out to being uh, in the lab, working towards a degree and playing, you know, playing the sciences to now having had that background on the academia side, I get to teach a little bit. Um, I teach the labs, but at the same time, I am helping students who were once just like me figure out what is the best career, you know, path to take for them, because that's what it's all about. You know, um, it's not enough to say that you want to go and become a doctor, you know, because it's a lot harder than what we make it look like, believe it or not. I don't know if anybody has told you all that, but it is a lot more difficult than what it seems. And so you want to be sure that when you make these decisions to go on and get these higher degrees, whether it be a master degree or a doctor degree, that you are solely making the right choice for you. Um, it's not about, you know, necessarily family pushing you to do those things because you're the one sitting in these classrooms. You're the one who's going to be working in the labs. And so, you know, you don't want to look back five or 10 years afterwards and say, man, I wish I would have really just given this a chance or what would have happened if I did try to go and, you know, pursue medical school and not just settle for, you know, whatever. You don't want to look back and you don't want to do that. Um, so, yes, I guess with that said, uh, I will conclude and pass the torch. Thank you. Great story. So fascinating. I don't think I can compete with you on that path. <laughs> so my experience um, probably is very different from many of uh, the professors are here um, because I grew up in China. I was born in China. I grew up in China until I finished my bachelor's degree, came to the United States to pursue my PhD. So um, I kind of know that I want to do science when I was little because my family, most of my family members are involved in the science fields. Uh, my dad is a professor in public health and my mom, um, she studies Chinese medicine. And my other relatives, they're all studies uh, like physics, uh, chemistry to some uh, extent. So I had this early influence from my family uh, so I never thought about studying um, humanity subjects, for example. But I loved both. I loved science, math, and humanity, all of them. And uh, it was uh, in high school that uh, the education I received was that in high school, after your freshman year, you kind of have to decide your track. Uh, whether you want to stay in science or you want to stay in humanity because the uh, national uh, entrance examination for the college will be different if you choose different track. So at that time, I decided, okay, I want to do uh, science track. 
And so that limited the, some of the courses I took in my high school that I will not took, uh, I will not take, uh, I will not take advanced uh, history, um, uh, politics, uh, those subjects. Uh, so uh, then when when gets to the college, you kind of uh, in the natural way that because you choose the science track, you learned a lot more about the uh, advanced science subjects in high school than in college, you would end up with a science major. And that's also a difference between the education system in China and in the United States that uh, for me, before I enter uh, and enter to the college, uh, and after I finish my the, and the examination, the, the um, national standard examination, without knowing my score, I have to decide what major I want to be in college, which university I want to apply at that time, based on your estimation of the score you get from that uh, examination. And uh, so I was um, debating myself between chemistry and biology because I love uh, both of them. I also like physics, um, but for biology, at that time, there is a rule that if you don't have a good eyesight, like to some, if you don't have good eyesight, you will have to score like 20 points higher than your peers to be able to get into that major. And I just don't think it's not fair for me. Why I wasted the 20 points on uh, because of my, the, my bad eyesight to become a biology major. So I thought chemistry has some combination of uh, math, physics, biology, all, all of those subjects that I'm interested in. So that's why I decided uh, to study chemistry, to pursue chemistry degree in, in college. So I went to Xiamen University, uh, which is very far away from my hometown. That was, at that time, it was 29 hours uh, train. I have to take a train to get there uh, for 20, 29 hours. And uh, during that time, uh, and during my college, I just enjoyed the chemistry subjects. So I wanted to pursue further with a PhD degree. And uh, um, my roommates, uh, actually three of my roommates, we all did very well in chemistry. And uh, three of us also applied to grad school in the United States. And all of us are still here in the United States in different fields. Um, so I came here uh, to pursue PhD in chemistry from WashU, exactly the same location as I'm currently working. And uh, during that time, I enjoyed the research in my first uh, couple years. And then I think it was my fourth year uh, when I uh, need to get ready for the uh, job market. I need to decide what exactly I want to do in terms of my career. I did some soul searching for myself. And, uh, and the aha moment actually came from uh, during an interview that I, I got an interview with a company um, that that person asked me uh, some questions and I often refer to the teaching examples. Like I love to interact with students during uh, my graduate school uh, when I'm a, a, a teaching assistant to working with the students in the lab, in the course. So the person who, who is sitting in front of me and saying, you seem to love teaching a lot. And that's an aha moment to myself. I realized, okay, maybe that's my passion. I, I got my PhD. Uh, I, I know I want to do some, some uh, research, some teaching, but I think in the end, I decided, okay, teaching will be my path. I want to focus on that. So I started to attend a lot of workshops offered uh, at Washington University to prepare myself, like learning how to write a teaching philosophy statement, uh, a philosophy statement and then knowing those uh, uh, cut edge, um, the teaching um, skills. Um, so that's all the preparation I did. And then luckily um, the year when I was graduating from uh, WashU with the PhD degree, uh, the chemistry department had an opening for a lecturer position and I applied and uh, uh, I probably did well. So the chemistry department kept me there as a lecturer uh, and then I worked there uh, to, to now. So it's been seven years that I have been working as a lecturer and now promoted to a senior lecturer in the chemistry department. 
Um, so I still appreciate uh, humanity subjects uh, because that's what I try to do in my college that I took some uh, humanity uh, classes uh, alongside the chemistry classes as well. So that's why when I had the opportunity to co-teach a class with another professor for this women in science class, I, I said, okay, I want to do it uh, because in this class, I learned a lot about the barriers that women uh, encounter in STEM fields historically and uh, contemporarily. And uh, it's a very small discussion-based class. We had a lot of great conversations with our students, what you, we can prepare um, before you go on to the career and what we can do in terms of for the future fields, how to make it better for everyone. So. Um, I guess I, I will stop there. I, I will leave more time for other speakers to tell their stories. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Luol. Um, so uh, I, I went off to uh, my undergraduate, I, I went to um, a public high school in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, which was a really enriching experience. Um, it was a very diverse student body. Of course, you don't really think about that stuff as, as a younger person. You just go to school with the friends you've always gone to school with. Um, but when I got to uh, my, my undergrad institution, which was a, which was a liberal arts school, um, it, was, it was amazing to me how many people would kind of come into my, my dorm room and kind of look at the pictures that I had up of my, my high school friends and made the comment to me like, oh, you, you went to a black school, like, you know, and they were, I, I didn't know how to interpret that. I never thought of it that way. And um, it was really shocking because I think the undertone was like, wow, and you made it here or like, you know, you're, you're, I, it, it, it was, it was, it was very jarring. Um, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I really liked science. Um, and so uh, I kind of got put on the pre-med track by my advisor, just kind of, you know, oh, you'll take intro bio, you'll take intro chem, you'll take intro physics, like just kind of see how it goes. Um, and I struggled a lot in my chemistry course. Um, my my um, quantitative reasoning skills were, were uh, not quite what that of my peers were. I kind of quickly put that together in the ways that I was struggling. I was doing I was doing well in my other classes. I was do, doing well in my intro bio course, but um, I think my intro bio course tested more rote memorization skills, and my chemistry course was really pushing me in terms of my problem solving skills. Um, but there was just something about my chemistry class that really kind of captured my imagination, even though it was incredibly frustrating. There was something that just kind of kept me coming back to that material. I was just kind of motivated, and it just felt really fulfilling every time I got an idea or I made my way through a problem and I finally put these ideas together. Um, and, then, and then in my second semester, that, that me liking my general chemistry and kind of not being that into my other classes was, it was becoming even more apparent. Now, now I had some problem solving skills. I was doing, you know, I, my, I was adapting to the college approach and I was really kind of, um, you know, picking up steam, so to speak, in, in terms of my success in the course. Um, but I didn't tell anyone that because I, did, I, I was the only one who liked chemistry. None of my colleagues around me seemed to seem to um, feel that way about their chemistry class. So I stubbornly um, kind of continued along the pre-med track, even though I, I kind of knew I didn't really have any interest in pursuing medicine as a career. And as a sophomore, took organic chemistry and anatomy and physiology. And um, I actually loved organic chemistry. That's definitely where I fell in love with the subject. Um, it was such a great story. Um, and in my anatomy and physiology class, um, our first lab was we had to dissect a cat. And um, I think it was like two or three weeks into the semester was our first lab. And I literally like walked into the room, walked across the front of the room and left the building. I was like, oh no, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I got to get out of this class. I cannot do this. I'm, I'm a chemist. Like it kind of, the first time I'd like said, I'm like, just get me out of here and just, I'll, I'll take whatever, like, you know, and in that, those days I actually like walk to the registrar's office. I couldn't pull this up on my phone. And, you know, I just go into this registrar's office, like, you gotta get me out of here. I'm a chemist. And they're like, oh, okay. All right. Well, let's figure this out. So, um, but I didn't know what I, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know anyone who had majored in chemistry. I didn't know any chemists other than like the professors who were teaching me. So I, I was just kind of 
um, you know, going to figure that out later, I guess. So um, then in my junior year, I got offered um, a, a not quite a TA role. And um, it, it, it was kind of a, a early on group centered learning. Students would come to this kind of optional session and they would, if they wanted to go, they would be placed into groups. And I kind of facilitated that session. And I just knew like that just clicked. The time went by so fast. I, I would walk out of that room and like, I feel like I can't believe they're paying me to do this. Like I would pay them for this experience. It was just so great. And so at that point I kind of knew I wanted to um, go into teaching. And at that point it was, you know, do I want to teach high school or do I want to teach at the, at the collegiate level? Um, and I didn't, I didn't know the answer to that question um, for, for uh, some time after that. I took a gap year between um, undergrad and graduate school to really explore that. I um, talked to high school teachers. Um, I worked at a tier one lab um, as a small liberal arts student. I really didn't get a lot of exposure to what a, a, a lab of that sort would look like. Um, you know, my, my experience was kind of Gen Ken lab and Orgo lab, which are really stressful and kind of follow the cookbook recipe and you got to produce this thing at the end. Um, and I was really pleasantly surprised with my experience at a, at a tier one institution of how collaborative science was. Um, yeah, I am a huge proponent of the gap year if you if you if you go about it the right way um, and really take full advantage and explore and make it a meaningful year. Um, I am so grateful that I did that um, because I was really ready to come. I realized I realized a lot of things and I was really ready to commit to graduate school and to go on to get a PhD. And and, and once I did that, um, if, if you're considering going to grad school, I think there's a lot of bad advice that goes on, um, it, admittedly, uh, mostly from, from white men in the field that will tell you like, just find some, just find a group where you love the science. If you love the science, it'll carry you through. You just have to love the science. And loving the science is a big part of it. Like you should do science that you are engaged, you know, and excites you and kind of captures your imagination. But if you love the science and you get into a laboratory that is not supportive of you, it's going to be a miserable couple, you know, several years. And so what I did was not only did I look to places where um, I was I was passionate about the science, but I talked to the grad students, I talked to the PIs, I emailed the postdocs to say, like, you know, here I, I kind of knew myself, you know, and, and there's lots of different approaches. Some PIs are really hands-on, some PIs are really hands-off. Um, so, you know, and, and there's pros and cons to, to everything, right? So you kind of have to know yourself and know what you need. I knew I really wanted a strong mentoring relationship with my PI, someone who was really going to, you know, check in with me a lot. Um, I knew I wanted a collaborative environment, a supportive environment, um, where there was really kind of a team mentality that grad students and postdocs all work together. Um, and, uh, you know, I knew I needed all of that. And I asked about, you know, what's funding look like? What, you know, if you had it all over to do again, would you have chosen this program? Would you have chosen this lab? Um, and I really invested in that time. And as a result, I had a really amazing experience as a graduate student. Um, and, and I would have done it all over again with the program and, and the PI that I worked for because I, because I had, really taken advantage of that gap year and um, then found the perfect fit for me. So um, I kind of, but I, but I knew ultimately what I wanted to do um, was going to teaching. So I sought out those opportunities as a graduate student. Um, kind of the minimum requirement is that you serve as a AI for um, three or four semesters at most places, but I sought out, you know, being um, an AI for upper level classes. I kind of took that on and negotiated that, um, you know, went to um, you know, various conferences geared at specifically for teaching. And so I'm um, kind of tailored my, my career so that, um, I, you know, I could end up in a, in a teaching position. So um, that's kind of how I got to where I am. And I'm, so, I'm just so grateful um, that, that that was my path, even though um, I think I went into college, you know, as I said, not quite with the quantitative reasoning skills as a lot of my peers. But I had such an enriching experience coming up through um, the public school system in in Baltimore, and and um, you know not being uh, not being the majority, even though you know I am I am a, a white woman in the United States, um, and and kind of forging those relationships. It's really um, really inspired a lot of the work that I take on now. So um, in many ways, I've I've had um, really enriching experiences kind of all the way through.
Wow. Okay. So um, it's my turn now. And I think I'll, I'll start kind of my whole little story with my junior year of high school, because that was really the most transformative year for myself. That was the year that I took AP environmental science. And that was the year that I essentially had to teach myself pre-calculus in trigonometry. Um, and within that, I guess, starting with the math side of things, I was uh, incidentally placed into the wrong level of math um, through my school. And I had to pretty much advocate for myself to be like, you know, I'm getting a hundreds on all of these tests. Like I need to get be put in the AP class. I need to be put in the honors class. And they were not listening to me. They were not listening to me. They were not listening to me. And I ended up finally being able to be put into that honors class, but it was two months into the second semester of my junior year. So that's, you know, we've had the whole fall semester. We're in the spring. This is all the way in February of the spring semester of a high school class. And I essentially had to teach myself the entire curriculum in order to catch up and then maintain my grade and then be able to take the tests and the finals and all those things. And that's when I realized that I have a very natural knack for mathematics. Um, it came to me easily. It's hard. It's fun for me, but it was something that I just knew that I that I had. In that same year, I took AP Environmental Science. Now that was my fun class. That was a class that I was enjoying, having a good time. And that year was the year of the big BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And I was uh, the person in my class that pretty much got all of us together and was like, "Hey." let's do something. And we ended up raising almost $20,000 to like donate to cleaning up the ocean. And I was like, okay, advocacy and environmentalism and math, here we go. These are things that I know how to do. I'm a 16 year old who, you know, has some type of resources, but these are things I'm good at. And these are things that I enjoy. And um, I went to a HBCU for college and it was a liberal arts school. And so they didn't have environmental engineering as a degree. So I ended up getting my first degree in mathematics. I was like, okay, this is easy. Let's, you know, smooth sailing for myself, you know, not to say it's easy, but for myself, I'm like, okay, I have a knack for this. Let's go ahead and go. Um, I ended up transferring uh, to a technical school for my environmental engineering degree. So I ended up getting the a bachelor's degree in both. In between that, um, I did some internships with NASA. And so I was a NASA co-op, which meant that I would do every other semester. So I would do a semester away in Houston, Texas to work at Johnson Space Center. And then I would do a semester of school and just kind of go back and forth until I graduated. <laughs> um, and so I ended up doing four semesters in four different um, departments. I worked one semester in mission control and I did flight planning where I planned the days of our US astronauts, um, essentially kind of coordinating schedules, doing site management, doing anomaly reports. Um, my second one was in mission assurance. So for NASA's newer um, flight vehicles, I was doing um, their safety testing, ensuring that they were pretty much safe for human life. <laughs> Um, so that included kind of doing, throwing them out of a giant plane and seeing how it lands, testing to make sure their recovery systems actually recovered the vehicle, making sure no water would enter into the vehicle. So I was on those teams. Um, I then went to engineering materials, which was related to safety, but was actually doing the like uh, strength and tensile testing of the materials used for these vehicles. And my last semester there, I did life support systems, which was working on their water team, um, making sure because a space vehicle is a closed system, they obviously have to use um, their urine or their waste to be their water, um, their drinking water for long planned trips. And so I was one of the planners that developed one of their filter systems. Um, now, while I was out there, I realized Water, that's my thing. I kind of like that. I think that's really awesome. You know, thinking of a place where you can take a waste, a human waste, and turn it into something that is drinkable, that is completely safe, that doesn't have any additional bacteria, microbes, growths, <laughs> and use as little waste as possible, or leave have as little waste as possible remaining. I think that is awesome. 
Um, but when I end, was ended up offered a full-time position at NASA, I was offered a position in the safety team, which was cool, but not necessarily what I wanted because basically I'm going for things that I really enjoy and I'm going for things that I'm good at. And so um, I ended up declining that and going to work for a municipal water district in LA. And um, that was a public agency that specialized in recycled water, which was what I was into. So basically taking water from the huge um, wastewater treatment plant in Los Angeles, recycling it, um, recycling it or cleaning it, treating it, um, and then using it for different purposes for irrigation, for the local refineries, for their cooling and boiling water um, uses, and then also groundwater barrier, which is kind of to prevent seawater to intrude into the groundwater aquifers in Los Angeles. Um, what I learned there was that the traditional public agency was a little bit too slow for me. It wasn't quite what I was looking looking for to be fulfilled. And it took a minute for me to realize, you know, is it the type of work I'm working on or is it just the environment? And I kind of went back and forth for a few years, kind of trying to figure out where I fit there. But a couple of things that I like had to note was, what do I like to do? And um, one of the like huge projects that I had last year was energy management, energy optimization. And um, essentially, uh, during the big heat waves in Los Angeles uh, last year, there were these huge heat waves that were creating blackouts, brownouts. Um, they were, it was, you know, 100 plus degrees for almost two weeks straight. And huge uh, treatment plants use a lot, a lot of energy. And so I was in charge of where are we going to optimize these pumps and motors? Where are we going to optimize to still fulfill? you know, we can't take water away from people. So still fulfill, you know, our requirement to give safe, reliable water. However, still managing to not overuse and create, you know, a deficit of energy, of electricity for the neighboring communities. And um, I found that extremely fulfilling. I found that fun. I found that doing, creating that analysis was something that like I really enjoyed but I still didn't feel quite fulfilled in that position. And that's kind of where I transferred to my current position at LEAP. Um, it's a startup, but it does that same energy management, energy reduction um, from a cloud-based system and sells back that energy to the grid as a virtual power plant and gives incentives to customers for their reduction. So if I live in my house and um, you know, I get this news that there's a giant, you know, there's going to be this great heat wave and they're telling me if you turn down your um, AC or your HVAC system for three hours, I can do that. It might be a little hot, but I can do that. And if a company tells me we'll pay you $20 for every hour that you reduce, I can do that and I get money. <laughs> and I think that's like a really awesome kind of position that I'm in now where it's like the things that I really enjoy but it also has that innovative aspect to it. Um, but it also kind of has this aspect of environmental action since we all know that low income communities are typically the first ones to have their electricity shut off or to have something happen in a grid emergency. And so my company adds that added reliability to communities by utilizing those renewable sources to lift that deficit. And so it's like, I feel good. I'm helping my community. I'm helping communities of color. And I'm also just always on action. <laughs> and um, I personally believe that you can't really have environmental innovation without addressing environmental injustice. And so it's nice that I still kind of have both of those aspects in my day to day life. And although I'm currently in energy, clean water initiatives are like my my big passion. And I worked at the water agency for three and a half years. And I still do work in water sustainability and advocacy for clean water and communities of color. But I think um, as long as I'm creating those, making sure that clean air, clean water and energy is accessible to the masses, I'm doing my part in what I'm supposed to, what my impact is supposed to be on the world. And so that's pretty much what has led me to where I am now.
Cool. Uh, I think I'm the last person. Uh, thanks to everyone for sharing this story. It's super interesting, uh, particularly for someone who is a bit earlier on in their career. Uh, so as I said, I graduated from Washington a few years ago, but I think for me, um, what I, I, I would say also, it's interesting when I, when I was asked to be on this panel as like, you know, women in STEM, I honestly didn't really process that I was a woman in STEM until <laughs> I was like, oh, I guess I am in tech and I'm like working with all engineers and we're building products. Like, I guess this is STEM. Um, so for background, both my parents are in medicine and it never really crossed my mind to become a doctor, to be honest. I was like, I really like science. I'm like, I feel like science is like their thing and I want to do my own thing. And my thing was that one day I wanted to run my own company. Um, and so that was kind of the operating model for how I chose everything sort of leading up to what I'm doing now. Um, and it really started for a few things. I think one, just personality. Like I kind of, I love being in charge. Like I love like, being able to like run stuff, get stuff done. Um, but I also wanted to be like a leader who opened doors for other people. Um, and I remember like specifically, I don't even know how this came up in conversation with my family, but there was one night we were just talking about like the top CEOs and they were all like white dudes. And I remember for some reason that like really made me upset. And I was like, why are all these, like what's so special about them? Like, why are all these white dudes making decisions for everyone in the US and then by product, like basically like globally. And I was like, that's kind of crazy that one type of experience is like dictating kind of our lives. Um, and so I was like, I want to be a CEO. Like I want to make sure that people who are like, who look like me feel like their voices are being heard and we're able to like, we're able to like make decisions as well. Um, I kind of thought that business was the driver of really making change. I think some people find it in different things and, you know, it could be politics, it could be medicine. But for me, I was like, you know, money talks and I'm going to figure out how to, how to get into that. Um, so when I went to WashU, uh, as I said, my parents are both in medicine. So I knew nothing about business except what I learned myself. Um, and I uh, started in the business school. Uh, I knew I didn't want to do investment banking because I had seen movies where they were just like working forever. And I was like, I like sleeping. So I don't think this is the role for me. Um, and so I ended up choosing uh, economics and strategy as my major uh, because I really, in addition to sort of wanting to run my own company one day, I really loved thinking about how people made decisions and how businesses made decisions. And I like remember taking game theory and really like, thinking that was so interesting of trying to like map out like, okay, if this company does this thing, like what does that mean that this other company will do? Then how will that like sort of lead the chain of reactions? Um, and so like thinking about really strategic things and like, I think it's from this competitive sense of like wanting to win. Like I just love like really doing those intellectual kind of uh, thought exercises. Um, and I also minored in uh, Chinese in college as well. Um, and I think that I was just really, I, I think another part of me, in addition to this running a company one day, I just love learning about different cultures, different languages, stuff like that. Uh, and just like loved having a sort of global perspective of the world. Cause I think it just, it really opens up your point of view and makes you think about things, um, in, in very different ways. Uh, so I, I studied econ and strat and I was like, I don't want to do investment banking. Like, what are my options? And everyone was like, well, if you're an econ strat major, you should do consulting. And I didn't know what consulting was. I'd never heard of this term. And then someone explained to me and I was like, this sounds like a made up job. Like you're just telling companies like, you know, what to do. Like, and you just got out of college. Like, what is this? Why would someone ever pay you for that? Like, <laughs> what do we know? Um, but I was like, okay, well, you know, I guess I'm doing consulting. I don't really know what else is out there. Um, so I kind of planned, which I, I don't know if I would necessarily recommend this, um, looking back, but I think I ended up in the position where I am now. So I think everything works out, but I kind of planned my like college, my early college career around getting into consulting. And I was like, okay, like what are the best consulting firms? Like, that's what I'm going to go for. And I'm just going to like, uh, sort of, uh, prepare my experiences to be competitive in this in this role. So I did an internship or the first summer I studied abroad in Shanghai actually. 
uh, doing a language immersion program. And then the second summer, I worked at a startup in St. Louis. And I was like, hey, like, I told my manager, like, I've been doing the cons consulting thing. Do you think I can, like, work on some strategic stuff? And maybe I can, like, sort of spend that in my interviews. And he was like, yeah, sure. Like, you can make, you know, whatever experience you want, um, which, was, which was really awesome for him to do. And so uh, I go into my junior year, and I end up recruiting for consulting. And I did an internship at McKinsey uh, in their Chicago office. And uh, I was like, okay, like, I know my plan, like do consulting for two years, go to business school, and then go back to the McKinsey, and then somehow your life is set, and then you can one day run a company. So I really hadn't thought it that much through, but I was like, okay, I have like the next few years at least. So I um, do my internship at McKinsey, and I quickly realized that I did not like it. Um, but I was so competitive and like really wanted to prove to like everyone and myself that I could do this, like despite that I was very unhappy um, with what I was doing. And I, it wasn't necessarily like the work itself. I think I was unhappy for a few reasons. One was I just I think it was hard for me to work a lot of hours for something that I didn't really care about. Um, like we were just essentially helping companies that already had a lot of money make more money and I remember one of the companies that I worked for I like it was I had a really difficult internal conflict because I didn't support a lot of the stuff that they were doing to communities of color and I was like helping them essentially target more communities and they would be like okay well like you should like think about going into this community blah blah, blah. and like in my heart I'm like I can't like you know to tell them to do this and this really just goes against my morals so I think that was like really difficult for me to like deal with um but I was like this is like the best consulting company like I have to I have to do this and I have to make this work and um it wasn't until towards the end of my internship I actually had some friends uh visit me and uh, I, they were just like, I think they just decided beforehand that they were gonna have a sit down with me and be like, what, why are you trying so hard to be at this company that you don't really like? And so um, basically they were like, Tyler, like you are not happy. Like you said, you don't really love the work. I think the people were, were great, um, but you don't really love the work. And I feel like you should be using your energy on something else. And I was like, I guess so. Like, I think I've cried one too many times in, in this internship for this to be my experience for the next few years. Um, so I finally, after like almost till the end of the internship, decided that uh, I couldn't really do this anymore. Um, I almost just like stopped after the ninth week, but then I was like, I actually need to pay my rent. So I need to work this last week and, uh, and then I'll just like start looking for other roles. Um, and so on one of the, the studies I was on, we worked on like uh, data, data protection, GDPR, like stuff like that, and understanding how like, um, I guess like data would be shared across like companies, across countries. And it kind of made me realize like how important technology was. And, you know, I never had thought about technology ever, like going into uh, that kind of role. I was an engineer. I didn't study computer science. So I didn't really think that was like a path for me. Um, but I knew that there were like strategic roles within tech. And I thought just like thinking about how these different tech companies made decisions was super interesting. And considering it was kind of like the future of every industry, I was like, okay, I need to learn how to, how to do this. Um, so, you know, whatever, whatever the world like gets to, like I'm kind of already ahead of the game in terms of like knowing like what's, what's, um, what's really making sort of impacting a lot of decisions. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, let me try to find a job in tech that will somehow accept someone who only really wants to do case reviews. Um, and so I just sort of looking around and I knew really nothing about tech. I was like, do you guys have the business side of the company? Like, let me interview for that. Um, so I interviewed for a bunch of different companies. Uh, ended up interviewing at LinkedIn. Um, and at first I wasn't sure if I was gonna like LinkedIn. I was like, I love the product, but I don't really know a lot about LinkedIn. And I just, I also am like, I don't know a lot about tech in general. So who knows what's gonna happen. 
Um, but just going through the interview process, I really like love their mission of creating economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce, which I think everyone at the company like knows that mission by heart. Uh, but I also just love the environment and the people and the culture. I think tech is generally more relaxed than maybe a consulting job. Um, so I was like, I was just super excited about it. And I remember at my like final final round interview, which was in San Francisco, um, I was at lunch and people were talking about the project they were working on. They were super excited. And I remember thinking like, I didn't know you could be excited about the stuff that you work on. Like that's, that was a crazy concept to me. Cause even in my internship, like people were like, not really that happy. They were like, I'm just doing this to get to my next thing. Um, so I was like, wow, like this seems like really cool work that they're doing. Like it's really making impact on people's lives and it's impacting just like, you know, people like you and me, not just huge, uh, huge companies who are already making money. Um, so I was like, if I get this, like, I definitely want to do it. Um, so I ended up getting into the program and it's a rotational program where we rotate onto different sort of strategic teams. Um, so I did rotations across um, product strategy um, and a product, I didn't know what this was when I went into tech, but a product is essentially like the, the thing itself and like what you work on. So for example, LinkedIn premium is a product and then you have product managers who are in charge of that entire experience. Um, so they have a bunch of different product managers for like so many different parts of LinkedIn. Um, so I was doing some strategic work on the premium team for a few months. And then I went into sales strategy, which I didn't like as much. I didn't really get into sales, uh, but it was, it was cool to experience that. Um, and then on my third rotation, this is around when like COVID was in full swing and really impacting people's lives and jobs. And I wanted to work on something that was going to be helpful in some way. Um, so I ended up being on the product marketing team for careers and we were testing a new product. Um, there was like this like sort of buzzword of skills-based hiring, like that was starting to come up at LinkedIn. And um, as I learned more about it, I was like, this seems like a really awesome concept of hiring someone based on their skills. It's super like, you would think that it's pretty, you know, table stakes and that's how you people should get hired. But the reality is like most people get hired based on where they went to school and who they know. Um, and your skills are important, but it's not sometimes the first thing that people see. Um, so there was like kind of this like big bet of, you know, can LinkedIn uh, help people get hired based on their skills and level the playing field. And we're going to test this product at Great Topper Conference, which is a conference for women in tech. Um, we're going to target it to entry level software engineers. And we're going to see how it goes. And I was like, okay, like I've never been on like a new product. It's kind of like a startup within LinkedIn. Um, so joined that team, um, worked on this like pilot launch um, from the marketing perspective. I uh, thought it was really cool, but just like wanted to get more on the building product side, um, which got me into my current role, which I've been in for a few months now. Um, I'm still on the careers team, uh, but more focused on building the product. So essentially what a product manager does is they're kind of like at the intersection of technology, business, and design. And they, some people say it's like the, the mini CEO of like a certain part of the company because you're working with a lot of different people and you're kind of driving something forward. Um, so you're not really a CEO because you don't like hire and fire people, but you do make all like the decisions of what happens, uh, which I was like, that seems like a really awesome job. And I feel like I would be really good at it. Um, so I've been doing that for a few months. It was a bit intimidating at first because I don't have a technical background. I'm working with like, you know, engineers who have been in the field for a while. Um, but fortunately, the culture at LinkedIn is pretty awesome where it's like very much a learning culture. And I feel really comfortable like asking questions. I was like, and then they would be like, oh, Tyler, like, should we, should we launch this? Like, should we do this? Like asking me like super like technical questions. But I was like, I literally don't even know, you know, what you're asking. So <laughs> we would definitely have to walk through this, but we've gotten to a point where I feel super comfortable in my business and strategic background. Um, and they obviously have a technical background and it kind of works together to drive things forward. So they ask me questions about like, you know, what are the strategic priorities of the business? How do we like get there? Like, how do we create a product that's going to achieve this goal? Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been great and hoping to continue in product management after uh, the program. Awesome. I am, I mean, hand claps, 
all the love. You guys are amazing. <laughs> um, yes. So like Travis snaps, um, this was, that was great. And we're little, that was only the first question. <laughs> Um, so I do want to pivot a bit because I do want to be mindful of time. Um, and so I don't know exactly how long everyone intended to be here. I had this timed out for two hours, but um, I do want to be respectful of time. Um, so I do want to go into the next question, but I'll allow it to be like a popcorn kind of situation. So if you are um, dying to answer this question, please share out. Um, and so again, going back to our theme, break the glass, um, and that is in reference to glass ceilings um, and how women are having to move um, in their fields. And so um, I wanted to ask if you have had a situation where you've had to deal with um, a barrier and how you overcame that, or if you wanna brag about yourself um, and share out an accomplishment that you had, and um, I'll let you all um, go around and answer that. Would it be easier if folks went in the same order? Yeah, I can go. Um, and I'll just be really brief. Um, so I mentioned that I'm in epidemiology and I think that um, for me, some of the challenges or barriers that I've had is being um, two things. One, a woman of color in epidemiology. There are very, very, very few of us. Um, and so, I, you know, sort of like pride myself on on being representative in this in this work. Um, even even where I work now, um, most epidemiologists don't look like me. So that's one. And then two, I'm, I'm pretty young. You know, I look pretty young. Um, <laughs> and so I think that that is another sort of um, barrier in a sense. Um, there's this, you know, this 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 cloud of imposter sy syndrome that um, that comes and goes with the work that I do. And um, I think that it's really apparent that um, even just listening to everyone's um, story of and their journey of, of where they are and how they got there is that, you know, we have to constantly have this internal motivation um, to pursue the things that make us happy, to pursue the things that we enjoy, to pursue our passions. And there's going to be obstacles because we live in a society that does not, well, up until the most recent election, did not represent um, a lot of the maybe ideals that, um, that many of us come from, um, you know, based on how we were raised or where we were raised. And so I think that, you know, there's this top-down phenomenon of power, and I am happy to see currently that there is being a, a stronger push for a bottom up. Um, and so I think that for, for women in STEM, regardless of your racial ethnic background, I think that we have, um, we have events like this, we have recognition, we have you know, an international day you know, for STEM. And I think that there's becoming, there has been a more recent awareness or acknowledgement and pat on the back even for women in STEM and STEM in general. And I think that for us, we just have to continue to, um, to help bridge the gap and increase the pipeline for you know, kids to know what, what, does, what does a field or a position or a job even look like that's non-traditional from just you know, some of the typical things you think of when you think of science or technology that you know, we can really expand that and take our passions and put them into a job and so, um, so that was kind of like a two in one. Like I'm, 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 I'm proud that I've overcome being, you know, a young black woman um, in epidemiology and in research. Even there's not a lot of black researchers. Um, but then on top of that, being a young black woman researcher in epidemiology and really making a mark and standing firm on the work that I do and why I do it and that it's important and that I have worked well. Um, worked hard to earn my credentials. I have been in this field for a, enough time to say that I am not going to abide by someone else's rules around what my role looks like because I can create that for myself. Wow, wonderful, wonderful story from uh, Dr. Tang. So actually, I share that <laughs> that you look so young kind of uh, sentiment. Uh, so like, um, 
my first year at Washio, uh, um, I didn't rent a parking and I, I took uh, Uber uh, frequently and Uber drivers would always say, so you go to Wash U and which department do you go to? <laughs> so, and I, I kind of like, it, at first it, I took it as a compliment, but later I got kind of rebel. I started to say, so you think professors should look in a certain way, like maybe <laughs> uh, of a certain gender at a certain age. <laughs> So yeah, kind of, uh, I, I, I do share that sentiment. And and uh, I think one of the challenges, uh, we all face challenges, everyone face their own challenges. And one of the challenges really, um, um, my, my, uh, I, 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 I don't want to overgeneralize, but I feel like uh, Asians uh, are, are not used to talking about challenges. So I think that's one of my challenges. <laughs> and um, and uh, I, I think, um, um, th there was a moment like, so I, I talked to, um, uh, at the time I, I want to decide whether I really want to become a professor. I talked to a, a senior faculty member uh, uh, at uh, MIT where I was doing my, uh, my uh, postdoc and uh, who's a woman. And um, so I, I worried a lot about the tiger mom image of Asian women. I, I felt that <laughs> when I go into, um, a faculty role that will come with me. Like people will like perceive me as a tiger mom. And so how would a, a student want to work with me at all? <laughs> if like, like when they think about me, like they think about that tiger mom image. And, and this, I was also very confused because my mom was not a tiger mom. And, and not all the women that, Asian women that I work with a tiger mom like, and I have friends who are Asian women in science and very happy. <laughs> so like, it's not true. Like it's not true to everyone at least. And so, so I had this, uh, um, I had this chat with this uh, senior faculty member and uh, woman faculty member. And, and she asked me a, a very good question. She, she listened and she asked me like, um, um, so do you want to be like that? And so I, I was like, wow, that's such a, such a like a Eureka moment for me. Like I, if I don't want to be <laughs> a stereotype kind of image, I don't have to be. And I can, just like what uh, Dr. Towns said, I can create rules for like my role. And I think that that question was, it was a question, but it's so empowering. And I feel I felt like I learned two things about that experience. A is um, um, like the 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 lesson I learned itself. Like um, uh, it's uh, we, we do not have to be like the stereotype. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, we, we create we, we create our roles for uh, rules in our roles, and and B it is like talking about a challenge and uh, uh, with someone you trust can can really help you. That's, I, I feel like this is uh, also a lesson I learned. Yeah, so yeah, those are my challenge and advice. I think that is uh, Dr. Simpson. Yes, yeah. yeah, sorry, I was unmuting my, my phone here. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but I, I've been traveling the whole time. So <laughs> I've been trying to play it safe and everything and uh, just making sure that I'm still participating. Um, I would have to say the greatest challenge that I can recall, there's so many, I mean, if we're being honest, there's just so many, but uh, I think the great, the greatest one for me as of now, or over the couple, the last, within the past five years that I've experienced is just, um, in addition to looking 12 to 15, and often being reminded that every time I interact with um an administration or another professor, you know, um, is just being, having my ideas and whatever I say be respected and considered to be important rather than overlooked. So I guess just being acknowledged and having the quality of what is, what I say be taken seriously. Um, it used to be some time ago that they would say, you know, you, you earned the degrees and you earned the respect. But it seems now 
that that path has been crossed, that latter part is not necessarily being um, met at all times. So whether I'm interacting with the administration and they also are women or or male, you know, it's at, at times it can be kind of difficult for them to, you know, take advice or suggestions given and seriously consider them when decision making. And so that that can be um, that has been probably the most frustrating ordeal that I have personally encountered um, within my career. Um, yeah, I guess just complete acceptance and acknowledgement that I too am a part of a, I guess a, a larger pool that can actually sit, have a seat at the table, and offer logistics and you know reasonable advice about something, and not just you know be saying something or pulling something out of my hat. Um, other than that, yeah, that I, I would say that's been, that's the greatest challenge that I've been overcoming because it's not it hasn't been overcome just yet but it's a, a growing everlasting changing um dynamic that I experienced but I mean it's just about learning for self how to um cope with not even cope how to deal with that situation because I never want to find myself coping with anything um, that was one promise I made to myself as a graduate student I will never settle and I will never cope with another thing um, but we'll find a resolution as to how to um, both overcome and to be informative about it. Because sometimes the other party doesn't necessarily know that they're imposing a certain challenge. So I have tried my best to let my peers and colleagues know that, you know, hey, moving forward, maybe we should, you know, um, have more sit downs or more meetings, inviting other members that um, identify with the same background that I'm coming from, you know, freshly out of graduate school. I guess you can consider this to be my first real professional career job, but, you know, I don't think that we would have accidentally been awarded a terminal degree if we weren't up to the, you know, if we didn't meet the standards. So with that being said, whatever I say should be seriously taken into consideration and not just overlooked or like, oh, okay, yeah, that, that sounds great. But you never mention it again. Um, and just being able to still um, not offend others, I guess I have more than one challenge and slightly um, not offending others with just my authentic, my authenticity, authenticity, sorry, some certain words just, ugh. Um, as you can see, the way that I'm dressed, I am not professionally dressed today at all. And I did not intend to be, but that doesn't mean that what I have to offer isn't just as valuable. And I think that a lot of times that can get misinterpreted or the perception of who I am as a professor, or as a scientist, or as a doctor, that really can, you know, um, get misinterpreted, but that, that's not, it, that's not okay. You know, it's not okay. I shouldn't have to dress up in a full suit or even talk like this using big words and all the, you know, the proper structure of communicating just for you to take me seriously as a scientist or as a person, because before I learned all of these big terminologies and before I got this degree, you know, I was, I was me. And part of what led me and what was enabling me to get this degree was who I was as a person, my personality. You know, we talked about uh, skills and innovation. That being a personality, having a personality plays a big role into that. So um, just continuing to um, overcome status quo and challenges that we face on a day-to-day -day basis has been, like I said, a, a ongoing challenge that I'm faced with that I think we all are and still are tackling. Uh, but other than that, you know, all is good. I, I don't, I try not to complain too much. <laughs> Great point, Dr. Simpson. Um, for me, um, to reflect on the barriers that I encountered in my career, I, I think the biggest thing for me probably are coming from the uh, cultural uh, differences uh, because I grew up in, the, uh, in China and uh, the education and the family influence I received are, uh, they, they all taught me that I should be a respectful person that I should be should not be very aggressive to express my opinions um, in, in, in front of um, especially 
elder or senior uh, people. Uh, so that was how I did in my first year uh, as a lecturer. Uh, so I most most of the time I remained uh, very quiet and silently listen to my team members um, to talk about the issues and uh, for somehow that gave them the wrong impression that I was not very engaged in the conversation, not really contributing to the conversation. Uh, but that was mostly because I, I thought interrupting my colleagues while they are talking was very, um, uh, it's not showing that um, they um, not being very, not being very respectful in that way. So I wanted to wait until they finished their sentence and there is a moment for me to start my sentence, but I just never get that chance because uh, people are just keep talking and talking. Nobody will stop just for you. So I learned that and uh, starting from my uh, second and third year, I realized uh, well, in this culture, you need to uh, advocate advocate for yourself because uh, your colleagues may not be able to, to understand your cultural background. They may not be, you know, uh, prompt you all the time to let you say uh, how you feel about certain things. So I kind of have to change my personality a little bit to, to take that adjustment that I need to be a little bit aggressive sometimes to be able to get my uh, voice being heard from my team member. Uh, and uh, and I still need to say that in the polite way so that it will not become very offensive to anybody involved in that situation. Um, so that was the biggest challenge for me in my uh, career in my first couple of years. Um, and then for the recent year, I would say that the biggest barrier or the difficulty I encountered, I believe that is true for many of us was the work-life balance that uh, during this year, the, we are working from home almost all the time. And then every day uh, when I woke up, I was on Zoom and I, and I worked until like nine o'clock, 10 o'clock in the evening, there was no really boundary between work and life. So that has been a difficult uh, thing for me to do uh, because um, we are teaching online, we are communicating a lot of information with students. Uh, via email, via Zoom, and just inevitable, you have to be available to uh, give their uh, responses in a timely manner. So, um, so that's that's how I felt about the barriers. But in terms of the accomplishments, well, not accomplished, but in terms of the uh, advice, um, I guess uh, no matter where, uh, at what point in your career, you want to be yourself, but also, again, <laughs> always do some soul searching. Are you really happy with what you're doing? Uh, I know the work-life balance could be difficult, uh, but I enjoyed this job. Uh, that's the most part that get me excited every day, you know, to woke up to, 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 do, the, to do this. Uh, so um, I will stop there. Meg, uh, Dr. Dotwa, did you want to share out? Sure. Um, I think one of one of the biggest barriers um, for me was was um, just acclimating to uh, the academic culture of of a chemistry department, and this was certainly ubiquitous in the in whatever chemistry department I was was a part of. In that, um, I feel like uh, when when um, diversity initiatives kind of first um, really started gaining momentum. One of one of the, the the biggest mistakes kind of early on was we took departments that were primarily comprised of white men. And even if they were, were um, white men of good intention, one of the early mistakes was um, I'm gonna I'm gonna promote diversity because I'm gonna, I'm gonna treat everyone the same. I'm going to uh, not not see color, not see gender, which of course meant that they were just gonna treat everyone the way that what they were treated. And you know we don't want to be treated like white men. We want to be treated like the people that we are as individuals and celebrated as who we are as individuals. And so 
you know, that culture, the way that they spoke to each other just felt very aggressive. You know, it was always very nerve wracking to like give a presentation or it just didn't feel supportive, you know, the way that that they talk to each other in the way that, you know, that, that they kind of um, defend their science. It just felt very aggressive. Well, why do you think that, right? Instead of what, what, what data do you have to support your conclusion, right? That just kind of, it just, the communication that happened, it was, was for me a really big challenge. And I think I was very susceptible to um, in, imposter syndrome. I was very susceptible to, um, you know, oh my God, it's me that's not going to make it. I really didn't have a lot of self-confidence and, and um, didn't really believe in my abilities. Um, even though like, even after many years of like, you know, I achieved a really high grade in this class or like I achieved the highest score on this exam or whatever it was, you know, I, in, instead of that kind of completing my data set of being like, wow, I'm real, I'm really good at this and, and, and I really deserve to be here. It was like, oh, well, that means the next time this is where I'm going to fail. And, you know, and, and it took really a long time to kind of build that confidence um, and to be able to voice that to my colleagues of like, why are you saying it in this way? Like, let's try to change the way that we approach this to feel we all want to support our students. We're all on board with supporting our students. Now let's let's consider how this this message or this tonality might might be received. So I'm really working to kind of change how um, how ideas uh, are are communicated when there's such a big power differential between student and professor or administrator and, and student or whatever the case is. Um, I think there were two two really big barriers. And to be honest, sorry for the dogs in the background, um, barriers that you know I I still still struggle with you know from time to time. And I definitely try to make it a point to message that directly to my students since I teach a, for, you know, a class that's primarily taken by first year students to really message that um, and, and build that confidence um, in, in our young students because I think that's really important. Um, so for me, I think the, the like greatest advice that I would give to somebody is, um, don't let other people uh, tell you who you are or tell you what you are. Um, if you if you have an idea of who you are, what you mean, what you do, um, stick with that. I think I had I've had a, a multitude of different types of supervisors, manager, managers, team leads, um, and I have one in particular who whom we didn't necessarily uh, mesh or get along in the, in the you know, greatest way, but um, they were constantly belittling me and constantly, you know, trying to knock me, knock me down. Um, there was a point in time where we had an individual meeting where they basically called me, not basically, they, in those exact words, called me incompetent um, to my face and you know, that's really heartbreaking for, for someone who is early in their career, has some type of aspiration to either reach where they are at or surpass or, you know, and sometimes the, the work life gets very competitive and that's just a means of somebody trying to get in your head. And so um, for me to have internalized that um, would have set me back. And so it's like, don't let other people speak things onto you. If, you know, you know, you're smart, you know, you're competent, you know, you provide great work, you know, you're very analytical, stick with that, stick with who you are, what you are, what you produce, because eventually that stuff is going to come to fruition and it's going to prove itself regardless. And so um, there's going to be a lot of circumstances where you're the only one like you in a room and it's like stay, staying in your sense of self is so, so important um, not to allow those others to like tell you who you are. Um, I think I'm the, the last person. I think the question was around advice. Um, I think everyone had a lot of really good points around, you know, think to yourself, imposter syndrome, stuff like that. Um, so I don't want to repeat any of those. I think for me, especially being a bit earlier on in my career, 
I would say the main advice that I have and also something that I wish I would have started earlier is, uh, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> maybe I'll do the, I'll do the, the barriers with it. Um, I mean, it's, they're kind of related. So I would say for me, I think the biggest barrier is honestly more internal. Um, I had a lot of imposter syndrome starting off my job at LinkedIn, coming from a non-technical background. Everyone at LinkedIn went to Stanford or Berkeley, essentially. Um, and they had been so like in this tech space, like for like forever, or at least like for the past, you know, four years minimum. Um, and I was like, I literally don't know anything about tech. People are like talking about like super, like things I have literally no idea about. And I was just like, I think I like tricked LinkedIn into thinking that I belonged here. Like they're going to figure out that I actually have no idea what I'm doing and they're going to like fire me. Um, and I think that is kind of related to my advice of instead of looking at like being new or not really knowing a lot as a barrier, like think of it as an asset. Um, and I think that actually helps me a lot uh, to just be more comfortable in my professional self and also just be more comfortable in my role. Um, I've been in a lot of uh, spaces where I am, I think every space I've been in, I've been the youngest person so far, hopefully. Hoping they'll be, I'll be like not the youngest person anymore, but every team I've been the youngest person, every team I've been the only black person. Um, my current team, uh, I work with five engineers, um, one designer, one data scientist, and I'm like two years out of college, like leading this team. And I am a black woman and everyone else is, all the engineers are male, um, the designers female. Um, but in the data scientist is male. And I went in and I was like, oh my God, like, <laughs> what are they going to, what are they going to think of this like kid just telling them what to do? Um, but I, I knew just like from my previous rotations and just like constantly being in new spaces and being on new teams that I just had to use like what I had as an asset. And like, there's a reason that someone thought I could do this. And I just had to believe in myself. And instead of, you know, relying on, um, just the heuristics of the role just being like okay like I am smart enough to do this someone trusts me with this I just have to believe in myself and they'll be fine and like taking this uh sense of just being new and like not really knowing what's going on to ask really like thoughtful questions and I think that's also a way of kind of demonstrating your intelligence um it's just really like thinking deeply about things and asking people stuff like for me it's a sign that I've done something right. If I ask a question and someone's like, I've never actually thought about that. Like, maybe we should do that. Um, and uh, fortunately that's happened a few times now. Um, but yeah, so I, I would say that's my biggest advice. And it just makes you feel a lot more comfortable. Um, like you are, you, you shouldn't think of being new as like a bad thing. Like everyone's new at some point. Um, so just like take it as, you know, I'm going to bring a new perspective to this team um, that they haven't experienced before because they're likely have been on the team for a while. So uh, you'll probably uh, introduce something to them. Awesome. Thank you all again for that awesome round. Um, again, I'm just like so pleased with the panelists. Um, at this time, I do want to turn it over to Maria. Um, and so she'll introduce herself, the organization, and she has a question for the panelists. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Maria Cruzzi. I'm a current junior at WashU and I'm also co-president of the WashU Women in STEM Club. Um, just to start off, I'm absolutely blown away by all of your responses today. Um, these are some really great questions that we have prepared and I'm just like still trying to process everything that you all have shared, which has been extremely valuable and I'm sure that all of our club members who are attending really appreciate it as well. Um, one question that I have on behalf of myself and the club, which the previous question kind of bled into a little bit, um, but just what advice or um, I guess skills do you think have really helped you advance in your careers and also um, within the transition between the different roles that many of you seem to have embodied in your careers so far? This can also be approached in a popcorn style like we did before because I think that worked pretty well.
I can go. It seems like nobody was muting. <laughs> um, I would say the skill for me was being able to think, uh, think in a strategic and structured way. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest assets that I bring to my team just from like, I don't have like a lot of work experience, but I do have experience, you know, studying game theory and then being in consulting. Um, basically all of consulting is like put a framework to every problem. Um, and I think that's really helpful to create a structure and guidance and direction for a team. Um, and I think I learned that from, my major, but I also just learned that from like prepping for interviews. And I think it's sometimes an underrated skill. Like I remember being like, why do we have to like really learn this framework thing? But people like, especially when they're really excited about something, like they can just talk forever and it can just kind of go over the place. And then you have no idea what you're actually working towards. Um, or if there's a really ambiguous problem, like how do we capture this market? You know, like how does one even like start thinking about that? Um, and I think that skill of like learning how to create frameworks uh, from, you know, my game theory classes and consulting was, was super helpful in uh, all of my roles up to this point. I think for me, it was really um, identifying my soft skills and my hard skills. Um, so my hard skills are, you know, understanding data, being able to um, run code in SAS, um, being able to understand what the, what the outcome is gonna be the results to tell a scientific or public health story or message. But then my soft skills are, you know, being able to communicate effectively, being able to, you know, speak to different audiences, whether I'm talking to professionals or students. I also taught for a while, um, I taught human sexuality to undergrads. So being able to talk to students, being able to talk to community members or stakeholders. So really being able to, um, you know, be adaptable and um, fit in, um, like knowing my, knowing my environment. So knowing, you know, when it's appropriate to do one thing versus another thing. When do I need to talk, you know, and use scientific jargon or when can I just talk in plain language? Um, and the same is true for my writing. So I write, you know, academically in, in our, um, you know, in different um, journals that are published and peer reviewed, but then I can also write um, a very, you know, um, you know, one pager or a fact sheet um, or even a blog, you know, so just being able to adapt. And I think that that's, that's the advice that I would have that if you, if you know that those things are your skills or your passions, um, you know, utilizing those, you know, science doesn't, or science, you know, STEM in general doesn't have to be so um, structured and so formal, you know, it can be informal um, and we can, we can bring that to the table. Um, I really love what Tyler was saying about, you know, um, being new, being young, that is not, that is not a barrier. I think we've seen it that way, but it doesn't have to be. Um, I remember a quote that said that every expert was once a novice. So, you know, in order to be an expert, you have, you, you have had to start at some point where you knew nothing. And so we can't allow ourselves to get up to the point where we are now experts and forget where we were at the beginning. Um, and, and for those who are starting out at the beginning, knowing that at some point you will be an expert in something and that give yourself time and, um, and grace and, and allow yourself to develop, you know, appreciate the journey of developing rather than being so focused on reaching that end goal because you'll never reach it. I mean, we're all still growing in our fields. So th that would be what I have to offer. I, I totally agree with Dr. Thomas said. I think communication is very, very important. I, I believe most of the careers you choose, uh, in the end, it will become um, an interaction um, with people. 
So be able to communicate so what you, you, you're you doing is very important because that would demonstrate your accomplishments, you could sell yourself, all of those are very important. So interpersonal skills uh, absolutely is important. Um, and then the other thing I also uh, echo Dr. Tan said that uh, when you are in just starting your career, you are new in that position, and give yourself some time to adapt to that position. So I would refer to growth mindsets. Uh, we are all, you know, we, we, we could experience some difficult time when you are uh, just to get to a new environment. You may encounter difficulty in the first couple of years in during your career. That's common. You do not want to be too harsh on yourself. And that's the, the common thing we, we, we have seen from women that so they tend to set a very high um, standard for themselves and being too harsh for themselves. Uh, we don't have to, to be that way. Uh, you wanna give yourself some time to grow. And in that time, you can tell yourself, I can grow, I can learn those skills. Uh, so growth mindsets always, you know, uh, you, you need some time, some um, path to get there uh, where you want to be. So, uh, so that's just my follow up on Dr. Tana's um, suggestions. I'd like to jump in, I think, kind of going off what um, uh, our previous panelist has said, um, along with kind of giving yourself time and space to become an expert in uh, what you're doing or what you're learning, also don't hesitate to ask questions. It's always just so much better to just ask those dumb questions, ask those stupid questions, those obvious questions, where you think it might be like a simple answer, and it might just but asking those questions might prompt discussion or a change in direction or something else that um, really just caters to your learning and your growth. And you won't be able to be that expert unless you kind of know that information. And so, and your growth potential and in those growth phases, um, ask those questions. I would say um, finding good mentors is incredibly important. Finding good mentors within your organization and finding good mentors outside of your organization. Um, you know, integrity is really important. So, you know, who you who you trust with information, you know, we're all working with human beings at the end of the day. And sometimes you need to seek advice outside of your institution. Um, depending on you know what situation you have to be navigating is is really really important and and forming strong partnerships with with um, others who share your identity um, it's it's really important you know if if we'll find you'll find yourselves in a, in a lot of situations where you are the only woman you're the only person of color you're the only, you know what, whatever it is but if you're not in that situation you know, work together. It's so much easier, you know, if I, you know, I, I have found myself in meetings, um, you know, sticking up for other women going, isn't that what she just said? You're, you're literally saying what she just said three minutes ago. And of course, the response is always like, well, no, what I'm saying is a little bit different, but it's not, it's the same, right? But, but it's so much easier when I can say that for my colleague, rather than you having to voice your idea or voice your opinion or whatever it is and then defend yourself as well so um forming those those strong um connections um is 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 really important and i think i think um being transparent about this you know i've, I've been in situations where this thing happened to me um and i if i want to seek advice uh you know i have i have my mentors that i can turn to but the decision is always you know i, I I don't want to. I don't want to be gossipy about this, right? I, if I'm if I'm seeking someone else's opinion, I want to be objective. I want to be transparent and say this happened. I really want to seek your advice rather than just to kind of run my mouth about about somebody else. And then and then make the decision as to whether I confront that person or, or not, right? But to really be intentional about with your words and your actions around this is 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 really important because if you're just if you're just kind of saying these things. 
to kind of complain about them and not be an agent of change, that's not that's not helpful for you or or anyone in this community as well. So that would that would be my advice. Professor Ling or Dr. Simpson, did you all want to share? I'll ask you, Panis. I feel that I've incorporated advice part with the challenge part. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Panis. I don't have any further input. I think that um, that was touched on and covered pretty well. Okay, um, so that brings us to the conclusion of our event. Um, thank you so much to everyone for contributing, not only your time, um, but your experiences, your vulnerability and transparency. It is very much appreciated. I will be in touch afterwards um, so that I can send you all a token of appreciation. Um, this was phenomenal. Thank you all so, so much. And I very much appreciate our student org for collaborating with us. Thank you all uh, for doing that and getting the word out about the event. Um, and then if there is nothing else, um, I will pause the recording here.